Welcome back on the Space Info podcast. Here we talk about space and everything related to it. If you are passionate about space, astronomy, technology and everything about it, you can join all our social platform at the Space Info Club or our website at www.spaceinfo.club where tons of content and a community of experts are there waiting for you. This is the Space Info Club. And good morning to everyone. Today we have uh, again a special guest. We have Ruby Patterson and maybe you remember her from our previous episode when we talked about the commercial space and intuitive machines landing on the moon. It was something like one month ago and if it's the first time you are listening to the Space Info podcast you are, uh, and you don't know her, Ruby Patterson is currently working at Astralytically, who is a, which is a space consulting firm and before Astralytically Astralytical, she was employed as a Mars geochemist at NASA Johnson Space Center. Her work there contributed to active mission on Mars, the Moon and Earth. Ruby led a research expedition to Iceland last year and is a doctoral candidate in geology at the University of Houston in the United States. In her free time, she is planning a mastermind group to take place this spring during the full solar eclipse. You can also find her on LinkedIn as Ruby Patterson and on Instagram as Ruby the Space Geologist. Indeed, the last topic is the topic of today's episode. Today we are going to talk about what's referred as the Great American Solar Eclipse. So are you excited about this, Ruby? I'm not excited at all. I don't know why anyone would be excited. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yes, everyone, <laughs> everyone I know is losing their actual minds talking about the solar eclipse. People are making plans to travel far and wide from all over the country. People are literally flying to the, the path of totality, which just means they're flying to places where the eclipse will be at 100%. And it's really captivating the American public right now. Yeah, also uh, I'm looking from outside, from, from Europe, and I, I, I don't have friends who are planning to travel on uh, on. On the, uh, on the other side of the ocean but I, I think that the vibe is uh, is increasing because I'm, uh, I'm I'm talking to you and also to, to other people who are living there and they are all very very excited because also the the, the day is coming um, I'd like to say that uh, today is 26th of March and the eclipse is planned for the, the 8th of April yes that's right and what 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 are you what are your your plans my plans i'm so excited i called up my girls and we are going to a, this little ranch in texas and so a lot of um, the women that are coming already live in texas so i'm flying from california to this tiny town in the hill country of texas called rock springs and it's maybe about an hour outside of austin and the reason why we're flying there is because it's in the path of totality which means that we can just lay out outside and some lawn chairs and put on some eclipse glasses and enjoy each other's company and what makes this even better is that we're all friends already and we're all professionals in the space industry so this is a very cool niche experience for all of us yeah and you're, you you talk about the pro professional of, of the field and also the the, the way uh, people are flying to to reach the the site of uh, of the eclipse and uh, particularly some some uh, states of uh, America, but we, we maybe we can rec uh, recall that uh, in the past when uh, we had Concorde actively flying, uh, people on board were able also to, uh, let's say, chase the, the shadow of Eclipse and the record still holds today, which is 74 minutes of uh, the Concorde flying in shadow, because uh, uh, if you want, uh, if you are uh, wondering how fast you should be flying to, to follow the shadow on Earth, well, you should be flying faster than the speed of sound. The, the record is 74 minutes for a plane uh, soaring the Earth's surface and being inside the uninterruptedly in, into the shadow. But uh, today we don't have this kind of uh, uh, civil airplanes to, to do this so th the only option is uh, looking at the eclipse uh, uh, on, on the surface of, of earth so uh, I think that uh, staying in Texas is one of the best place to, to assist on to, the, to the thing yes and I've heard a lot of stories if you plan on traveling anywhere for the solar eclipse especially into the path of totality make sure that you are filling up with gas well before you get to your final destination I've been hearing so many reports of people 
um, especially like in these small country towns that a lot of people are traveling to, um, that they are preparing for gasoline shortages and also possible Wi-Fi and cell service issues due to an influx of people that are traveling to this very specific narrow band of land area that's sweeping across America. So if you've ever been to a really busy event, like a, like a music festival, for example, and you've tried to text your friends, you know that it just doesn't work. There's too many people there and their cell service is not going to work. Um, and so we are expecting the same thing to happen in a lot of these small towns. Yeah, and also in addition to these, uh, uh, let's say, side effects, uh, we, we'd like to, to recall the fact that uh, you should be very careful while watching uh, through your eyes the, the eclipse. Be careful of wearing uh, proper protection uh, devices. And also if you're a passionate photographer or a filmmaker, be careful uh, to use properly your devices. Also use protection uh, lens for your uh, cameras because they can be damaged, but the most The most important part is uh, your eyes. Be, be careful at uh, directly watching the, the eclipse. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you, you don't need this advice, Ruby, but maybe the people who are listening, uh, maybe they, they are beginners or too excited to, to think about this and you, they find them, their eyes uh, damaged by solar light. Yes, please do not stare directly at the sun, <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because maybe uh, people who are listening to the podcast are even more beginner, let's say, and someone is asking, what is a solar eclipse? Oh, okay, a solar eclipse is when the moon... This is a very direct question, but uh, that, that's the most important, that's the elephant in the room of today's topic, so what, what is a, an eclipse? and why it is solar in this case. Okay, so a solar eclipse is when the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, either covering part of the sun or the total body portion of the sun from a view on Earth. And so a partial eclipse is when part of the sun is obscured. A total solar eclipse is when the entire disk of the sun is obscured. And eclipses in general happen about every six months and total solar eclipses occur around every 18 months. But this is a really big deal because um, a lot of times these total solar eclipses occur over long stretches of ocean. And so it's really hard and maybe impossible for many people to travel to places where they would be able to view the total solar eclipse. And something that is also worth mentioning is that um, total solar eclipses only recur at, a guinea, at any given place once every 360 to 410 years. So this is very much um, something that has not happened in this region in Texas that I'm going to since way before America was even founded as a country. This is a very rare occurrence and that's why so many people are planning on taking their families and their children because this is such a rare occurrence, but also um, it, I've heard, I've never seen a total solar eclipse, but I've heard that it feels almost biblical in its magnitude. Like the sky goes dark and the crickets start chirping and animals get restless and it moves people truly, like it moves people to tears because of how big of a deal it is and how um, small you feel. And it's just a really cool way to feel connected to um, the, the solar system. Yeah, also maybe, um, yeah, you mentioned that uh, uh, you, you need the something like six months to have partial eclipses to reoccur here on, on Earth, clearly on different si different places on, on the planet. And also uh, talking about different places on, on, still on the planet, uh, but you need uh, 18 months to have a reoccurring total solar eclipse. So uh, if you're planning to, to stay in one single uh, place uh, on, on Earth and see again uh, an eclipse, maybe one life no for sure i, I mean one life uh, won't be enough because uh, you you need uh, something like uh, 360 and 400 years to have uh, again a, an eclipse to reoccur on the on the same place on on earth because we we have to think that uh, we are talking about uh, uh, the sun which we can consider as a uh, as still in, in the sky but but the earth and the moon are moving and their uh, relative movement uh, ma makes this uh, uh, this kind of event very very rare in our lifetime also maybe uh, not everyone is knowing that the moon is uh, moving away from from earth clearly uh, compared to the big distance something like 380,000 kilometers away from earth the moon is uh, uh, let's say escaping uh, uh, some something like centimeters per year 
but uh, if you sum up this, uh, this distance, uh, in the past you only had uh, total eclipses, but uh, in the future, in the distant future, you won't be able to have uh, total eclipses. Maybe you will have uh, annual sectors, but uh, total eclipses will be uh, even more rare, and uh, in the distant future they will be impossible. So uh, if you're wondering to, to see this event or not, uh, well, ma make sure to see this because uh, maybe it is the last one. <laughs> That's right. Wow, I didn't know that. That all of the eclipses used to be total eclipses. That's really interesting. Yeah, be, be, because the, the moon was closer to the surface of Earth. So when you you are in the shadow, you, you uh, well, the, the disk of the sun is completely obscured. But if you move the, the, the moon uh, towards the sun, relatively, when you're looking from the Earth, uh, it's smaller in the sky. So it won't cover totally the, the shape of the sun. But, uh, well, uh, this was only the, the first topic of today. I, I don't know if you want to, to add something. Uh, I'm just really excited. And if you have not made plans, if you are in America or you have the means to travel to America and you have not made plans to go to the path of totality, you must. You must. If you can, you must. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for sure. And we are also waiting your photo, photo on uh, Instagram at uh, Ruby the Space Geologist. <laughs> You'll get plenty. <laughs> Maybe your account will be, uh, yeah, you, you will, uh, your account will be as crowded as uh, this, the streets of Texas you guys, those days. <laughs> you guys will be sick of me. If you end up following me on Instagram, prepare to be sick of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And... Okay, now, um, uh, yeah, l last thing is, uh, remember the, the date is the 8th of April 2024, clearly. So we have something like two weeks, uh, less than two weeks to, to be prepared and to, to look at the eclipse. Now, I, I'd like to move the, the conversation towards something uh, that is uh, uh, as popular as this event nowadays. And uh, it's been very popular in the last decade. And now I'd like to talk about SpaceX and Blue Origin. And we are still talking about uh, uh, the moon, but now the, the plan is to land on the oh, on this uh, uh, satellite, natural satellite of Earth, and we start talking about SpaceX Starship because uh, this is very important because it will be uh, the very first big spacecraft of car to carry humans back on the moon. So. What's your idea behind this spacecraft? Is this uh, uh, only a dream or will be happening uh, near in the future? Well, I think it at one point was a dream and now it's very much happening. S uh, SpaceX's Starship was selected by NASA to carry astronauts back to the moon for Artemis 3 and Artemis 4. And so the Artemis program, the whole point is to return astronauts to the lunar surface. And so we've already had our Artemis 1 demonstration. Artemis 2 is going to fly, I think, four astronauts around the moon. Artemis 3 is when they're first going to land back in the lunar south pole. And they're going to continue to get more and more complex and bring more and more payloads and, and l luggage, if you will. Uh, this is really just technical payload stuff to have a more permanent um, and sustained lunar presence. Um, but SpaceX was contracted to bring astronauts back to the moon for Artemis 3 and Artemis 4. And these launch dates are not written in stone. Artemis 2 is going to launch in late 2025. And so we have no idea really when Artemis 3 is going to launch. All we know is that it will happen in 2026 or beyond. Yeah, also, uh, in my view, maybe uh, it's uh, being more and more likely that uh, uh, SpaceX will actually succeed in uh, landing or flying around the moon maybe before Ar Artemis 3 uh, will be able to do it. Because if we look at the, 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 fly the te test flying, which have been performed recently, uh, I see a lot of progress in, uh, in SpaceX, particularly in, in Starship. Uh, maybe people who are not uh, uh, of the space and aerospace field are seeing them as a, as a failure. I, I don't know your opinion about, but I think that uh, uh, SpaceX is uh, uh, fixing some goals before the flight and all these goals are actually accomplished. And we see some kind of, let's say, failures, but every time they are just a step, step beyond what's actually planned for that specific flight. Yeah, I think people at SpaceX know exactly what they're doing and they are some of the top talent in the world at building rockets and sending rockets into space and 
I'm sure that all of the failures or perceived failures to the public were planned and expected on their end. They're, they're a sharp bunch of folks over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I indeed. I I actually, they are also quite spectacular. Maybe someone have, has forgot the, the let's say, voluntary uh, blown off the of the um, Falcon when they tested the escape uh, escape system of the Dragon. But it was indeed very very exciting and very spectacular to see. I could not even imagine that a company or some uh, executive of any company could just do it on a voluntary basis and say okay let's see if this system works by just destroying a rocket and just blowing up uh, some some dollars in the sky let's say <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> and yeah now uh, on the other side also of spacex we have blue origin with the blue moon uh, um, program and th they are planning to deliver astronauts also themselves on the lunar surface as part of Artemis 5. We, we have talked about Artemis uh, 2, 3 and 4, we, which all have to still happen. And so Artemis 5 uh, is again still further in time. But uh, we have Blue Origin now uh, on, uh, on the contractor side. So how, how do, you see, do you see uh, they work uh, comparatively to, to SpaceX? There are so many differences <laughs> between the way Blue, Blue Origin <laughs> operates versus how SpaceX operates. But with respect to the human landing system called Starship, which is being produced by SpaceX, versus Blue Moon, which is also a human landing system, which is being produced uh, by Blue Origin, there are three main differences that I think are really important to highlight just in the span of this podcast. So. The first major difference between the two is their size. So first of all, Blue Moon, and its nickname, by the way, is Mark II. So they've already created Mark I, and now they're moving on to Mark II, and Mark II will fly to the moon as part of Artemis V. Um, but the size difference between the, these two human landing systems is astounding. So Blue Moon, or Mark II, is 16 meters tall. And if you are unfamiliar with meters, this is 52 feet tall. By comparison, Starship is actually 50 meters tall, which, is, which equates to 164 feet tall. Um, for reference, okay, for reference, 50 meters is the same size as an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So I just ask everyone who is listening to imagine an Olympic-sized swimming pool standing vertically upright on the lunar surface. This is an absolutely humongous human landing system, and the differences could not be more stark with respect to size. It's absolutely insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, talking about again about the the, the Blue Moon uh, um, program, uh, I've recently looked at the uh, documentary that there is on Amazon Prime about uh, um, uh, William Shatner, um, who flew the uh, let's say commercial rocket the new glenn rocket of uh, blue origin and uh, this document I, I don't know if you have seen it i haven't seen the documentary but i remember when william shatner went to space and how and how he was cry okay. crying and he was so moved by that experience yeah it, it is uh, i i don't i didn't remember him inside the um, uh, let's say inside the the, the clothes of uh, captain kirk of, of star trek uh, I, I'm quite of a fan of it, but uh, I didn't remember it. But when I saw him, I said, okay, now it's happening. <laughs> He's going to space. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that uh, if uh, uh, someone has seen that rocket, uh, they, they cannot relate really uh, on, on how SpaceX is being a Starship as big as compared to it. it that's way bigger. And also the, the purpose of the rocket uh, is um, is basically different. Uh, the, the second one will be more of, of a cargo one. Yeah, it will be it will be transporting people, but also uh, let's say external resources to, to the surface of the moon at least in the beginning. And also this is uh, one let's say one requirement uh, of, of the thing. So uh, we we can imagine as the a, a space truck uh, moving things from uh, from Earth towards the moon. And uh, now it, it's going to happen in a few months, in a few years. So it, it's a, a very exciting period to be to be there. Yes, yeah, it's definitely happening. As far as I know, more on the years scale as as opposed to like the months scale. But this is definitely going down, and it's actually really um, 
facing a lot of different challenges. Like when you decide to put a, a human landing system that is so big on the lunar surface, you really have to think about your landing sites very carefully because if you have a, a, a landing system that's as tall as an Olympic size swimming pool and you're trying to find a place for that to land, you want to make sure that you have a wide enough radius um, that is devoid of as many haz hazards as possible. And in the lunar south pole region, that's incredibly difficult just because of how many boulders are down there, the nature of the terrain. It's very different than a very smooth and smooth lava flow like what, where the um, Apollo landing sites were. The lunar south pole is a completely different beast and it's some of the oldest terrain on the moon. Um, we believe it to be, some, some of it to be relics of the early flotation crust of the moon, which means that it was some of the earliest rock to ever crystal, crystallize and solidify since the moon formed. And so this terrain is completely different and with that brings a ton of new challenges. And also, I have to say this as a scientist, it also makes it very challenging when you try to land a vehicle as large as Starship on the lunar surface, because imagine all of the dust that you're now kicking up, all of that regolith that now becomes airborne as a Starship descends to the lunar surface. You don't know how far reaching that disturbance will go with respect to the entire lunar surface. Um, some scientific studies, these were just models, these were not, you know, real studies, but they were very um, high fidelity computer modeling uh, studies, showed that even if you land a lander on one part of the moon, it actually disturbs the uppermost layer of the lunar regolith around the entire lunar surface. And so when I think about that, every time someone talks about Starship trying to land on the lunar surface, how much of those early, uh, early deposited lunar sediments are going to be now disturbed and we will be unable to to study them with any scientific rigor because they've been disturbed they're not in their original place anymore yeah indeed maybe uh, someone of the listener will uh, have have read the, the book by uh, gene kranz called it failure is not an option which I, I think is a very interesting book because uh, it talks about the the from the very beginning of uh, Uh, of NASA to, to the moon missions and indeed on uh, Apollo 11 it, it said that uh, uh, Neil Armstrong while landing attempting to land on the moon was the, the first to uh, to catch on uh, on the surface and indeed the the disturbances and the uh, let's say the regolith blowing around was the, the very first thing that uh, disturbed his maneuvering and also uh, um, his cap capacity of taking uh, controls and avoiding the automatic system to enter and land uh, is, it is the main success factor of landing on the surface. But uh, I, I don't think that uh, someone will be able to catch the uh, manual controls of, uh, of Starship to, to land on the moon. And uh, we have recently seen, uh, we were talking about this in the last episode of, of the podcast, uh, when uh, uh, someone tried to land an automatic system on the moon and uh, we were uh, parting because uh, it landed, but then we discovered that uh, it was not landing properly and just flipped it over. And uh, so it's better if we don't crash a starship on the moon, <laughs> at least on the first time, maybe. Yes, I'm definitely wishing the absolute success for, for SpaceX and for Starship. I want to see this be extremely successful because if it is, it ushers in this completely new era of astronauts on the moon. I mean, we are going and we are going to stay there. Like, And I don't mean the same person is going to stay indefinitely. We definitely want to be able to bring our astronauts back home to Earth. What I mean by we are going and we are staying is that we are going to set up infrastructure on the lunar surface to not only use the natural resources that are there, but also be able to perform science in situ, which, is, which only means that we are going to be performing science in place. And so if you think of a geologist on Earth that's walking around and doing a field campaign for multiple weeks in Iceland, for example, which is what I did last year, we want the same to be possible for astronauts on the lunar surface so they can essentially have an entire field campaign for several weeks at a time as opposed to several hours or maybe one day or two at a time. 
yeah, I think that there will be the uh, twisting factors uh, with respect to the present missions that we are going, uh, we are executing today also in a uh, low orbit uh, because uh, now, well, uh, then in the future they will be uh, almost autonomous, so people will be able to execute them, uh, let's say, in an autonomous way. They won't need any more uh, all those inputs, all those resources coming from home, and so they will be able to. Yeah, to, to live on the surface almost all, uh, autonomously. So, uh, and maybe uh, we have talked about uh, bringing resources on the moon, and so we can imagine ourselves going on the on the market and bringing food and all those things on uh, on the moon. But uh, uh, we, if we think about numbers, we can think about that uh, the blue moon will be able to bring something like uh, 20 tons of uh, of these resources from Earth to the moon. But uh, I, I think. Uh, that uh, uh, the, the numbers change a little if you if you compare this with the Starship and its capability. Uh, we know that there is uh, no liquid water on the on the surface of the Moon, but maybe uh, if uh, the, the w there was water, maybe some fishes would be able to to swim that water. But uh, maybe you know, Ruby, which kind of fish could be <laughs> swimming if uh, Starship, Starship would be able to bring it on the moon. <laughs> <I feel> <laughs> Just to give an idea of, uh, of, of the weight. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so Starship has a 100 ton payload capacity, which if you are unfamiliar with how big 100 tons actually is, just imagine a blue whale. A blue whale weighs 100 tons. That is how much payload that Starship will be able to bring to the lunar surface at a time. If you are not an animal person, this is also the same as an entire Boeing 757 <laughs> being brought to the lunar surface in terms of actual payload mass to the moon. Um, so this is a ton of payload and we will be able to bring a lot of stuff to the lunar surface to set up infrastructure or a, or a lunar base, for example, to, to have a sustained presence up there. Yeah, so uh, I, I think that this is very interesting and very stimulating. So if you find these numbers interesting and also uh, you find also the, the whole uh, field, uh, you're very curious about space and what's happening now, consider to visit the, the website www.astalytical.com and also to subscribe at the newsletter that you find them there because a lot of information is given you uh, for free and you can access a lot of content and also if you want to to have more content also visit the space info club website at spaceinfo.club and where also a members club is there is completely free you can also access a, a whole community of experts and people talking about this about this and I, I don't know if you ruby want to add something about this Yes, I just want to make sure that the listeners know how to spell astrolytical. And so what Sebastiano was saying is that we have newsletters that are completely free that have a lot of different insider analyses about the space industry at large. And so all the information, a lot of the information that we shared about Starship being compared to Blue Moon, for example, um, you can read all about that in our newsletters. And so astrolytical um, is spelled A S T R A. L Y T I C A L. And thank you so much for having me on today. I've have so much fun recording with you and I hope I can come back again in the future. Sure, it was much fun for me also. Yeah, I hope to have you back in the future, maybe with the results of your uh, expedition to see the solar eclipse. <gasps> And I hope uh, you have fun. I hope you are excited. I see you in video. Yes, I am excited. I can't wait. I would love to come back and tell you all about my, my solar eclipse experience. So see you in the next time and I hope you have you back by just telling me how it's gone. I would love to. Thanks so much.